Merry Christmas. It is a beautiful night. It's a beautiful celebration. It's a beautiful chance to be together. Welcome at home. Thank you for tuning in and celebrating the birth of Christ with us here tonight. We are so blessed to have you that you're, you're kind of getting the, um, you're either getting the very best of the night or the very worst of the night. This is our fourth service. And so either we're going to be kind of punchy or we're really going to be on one way or the other. But we are so blessed that you're here. Uh, if this is not your regular church home, I'd like to invite you back for Sunday morning at 930. We have our traditional service, which is very similar to what you'll experience tonight. And at home, we'd love to have you as well. At 11 o'clock, it's a contemporary service. Same message, a uh, little bit different trappings along the way, but the same Lord and the same Savior. So we would love to have you join us. In fact, if you are new with us tonight in the room, um, in front of you, you'll see a QR code. And if you just wanted to open your camera, your phone's camera, don't take a picture of it, but just hold it up there and it will take you immediately to a place where you can just sign in and let us know a little bit more about you. I promise we won't come visit you. promise you won't get on some unending email list or anything like that. We just want to be able to connect with you. So again, we are so glad that you're here. You know, um, we have a gift for you tonight. Uh, not only the gift of the music and the, the worship celebration that we have here, but we have a CD out in the lobby that Ben Ball, our organist, has recorded, and it is available if you're at home. Please just sign in on the website, uh, newhopefortmyers.org, and we'll make sure we send you one. If you're here in the room, you can pick that up. In fact, pick up a couple and you can share them. It's Ben playing this organ, which is a fabulous instrument, and he does a fabulous job with it. And so those are our gift to you. Merry Christmas. You can take those with you as you go. When you came in, I hope you got a candle. Did everybody get a candle? Okay. We are safe. Not only are we practicing good mask rules, but we are not allowing anybody to have any flame. We are totally safe. If somebody tries to light this thing with a, with a lighter, it won't work. But what you do need to do, if you just take the little flame and twist it down, it will come on. And so a little bit later on in the service, we'll get those out. We'll sing Silent Night. We'll create a momentous, memorable moment together. And so and then on the way out, you can just drop those off. Um, tonight, we're going to be assisted in worship tonight with, with two readers that will be leading us through the liturgy. They are both seminarians. We have the great opportunity here to train up leaders for the next generation of the church. And so Deb Fransway is a uh, senior uh, seminary student up at Bethel in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, Lincoln Roos is a freshman seminary student up at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando. And so they'll be leading our worship tonight. And we are so excited to have them. And we're excited to have you here as well. If you would, focus on the screen for just a moment. At home, it'll come up for you. And we'll get this worship started. Merry Christmas. We're so glad to have you with us as part of our Christmas Eve service here at New Hope. We know 2020 has been a wild ride for many of us, but it's also provided wonderful opportunities to spend more time with our loved ones and to serve our neighbors. You see here at New Hope, one of our core values is the whole church helping the whole world experience God's love. And we do that by consistently feeding the hungry right here in Southwest Florida, partnering with local agencies to make sure people's basic needs are being met and by investing our time in relationships with local schools and supporting the education system. 2020 has given us the opportunity to continue taking the concept of church far beyond the walls of our building and bring God's love to all the people we encounter. We'd love to have you as part of our New Hope family as we begin 2021. We have amazing opportunities for the entire family and would be honored to have you as part of our mission to continue to live out the gospel together in 2021. Be sure to visit our website for more information. God bless.
Please stand with me as we call ourselves to worship. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Father, you are holy, holy, holy. This evening, we give you thanks and praise as we celebrate the birth of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercy and compassion. 
We thank you for enacting a plan of salvation and reconciliation. We thank you for sending Jesus to dwell in our midst and to share in our many struggles and failures. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us sacrificial generosity, forgiveness, and what it means to truly love our neighbors. Thank you for sending your spirit to dwell in our hearts and continuously transform us to become more whole and holy. Tonight we celebrate your birth, Jesus, as the one true God that people could hear, see, and touch. We pray that you would touch our hearts and that we would bring you glory this evening and forever. We pray these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and his breath in his lips, he will slay the wicked. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.
In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. 
But he did not consummate their marriage until she had given birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. From the Gospel of Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria, and everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy with all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
reading from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. from the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when he said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Please stand as we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Jesus God, we thank you that we can sing the truth, that we can sing our hope. Our hope is in you, and hope in you does not disappoint. And so, Father, we thank you for the songs that you've given us, but even more, we thank you for the reason for the songs. We thank you for Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And we pray now that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, that you would inhabit the praises of we, your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, after all that, I feel like we can just go on home. Wow. Thank you all so much. Thank you, choir, Ben, Katie. Thank you all very much. Deb, Lincoln, appreciate all that you've done to, to bring us into the presence of God. You know, as a dad and as a man, I love this time of year. I love Christmas Eve. I mean, it's, it's, it's just awesome, isn't it? But as a preacher, I got to tell you, it's tough. 
Because we've already read the story like six times tonight. We've already sung the story like six times tonight. We all know the story. I mean, where do you find the suspense? Where's the build? Where's the release? You know? In fact, um, just finish these out. We three what? We three kings. We all know that one, right? What about this one? Oh, little town of... Yeah. Oh, holy what? Did that come up? Yeah. There was no room in the... See, we know the story. We all know the story. And so, you know, for us preachers, every year we get to this night and we go, Lord, what am I going to bring them? What can I bring them that they don't already know? And as I was wrestling with that question this year, as I was reading over and reading some other parts of the Scripture, I want to say God spoke to me through the Word. And he led me to a little passage in Galatians. And in Galatians 4, chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible tells us this. It says, when the time was just right, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Now, what does that mean? I mean, you think about that. There was any time in history that Jesus could have been born. He could have been born a year or two later, a year or two earlier. He could have been born hundreds of years earlier. He was from the beginning. We just sang that. We just talked about that. We thought about that. He could have come in human form at any time. What does it mean that when the time was just right, God sent forth his son? It means when you, when you break it apart from the Greek, that, that when it says just right, when the time had fully come, it talks about two different kinds of ways that things are just right. One of them is when you think about fruit. If you've got fruit growing on the vine, whether it's grapes or bananas, there is a particular time when everything is just right. You pick it a little too soon, it's going to be bitter. You pick it a little too late, it's going to be rotten. But there's that little bit of window of time when everything about the plant has produced the fruit. It's the fullness of time. The time was just right. The other time in the Greek when it talks about that is when a woman is ready to deliver a baby. We all know that if it comes too soon, there's, there's difficulties. If it comes too late, it's hard on everybody. But there's that one sweet spot, that one time when everything has come together just right so that that baby could be delivered. Well, that's what it's saying. What, it's, what, what Paul is saying there is saying the world was just right. The world had come to the point was just right to where it was time for Jesus to come. Now think about this. Some of the things that were going on in the world at that time, there was a guy named Alexander the Great. And in 350 B.C., Alexander the Great comes on the scene, and he conquered the entire known world at the time. Now that's impressive in and of itself, but what is really interesting is because he conquered the whole known world, he instituted one language, the Greek language. That was the official language. So everybody in the entire empire spoke Greek. They understood Greek. And so when the time came for the word to go forward after Jesus' resurrection, guess what? Everybody in the entire empire could understand Greek. Up until that time, every country had their own little language and every region had their own language and there wasn't a universal language, but God had it set up that when the time was right, when Greek was spoken everywhere, Jesus came. Well, a little bit after that, about 250 years after that, there was another guy who came on the scene, and his name was Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar went, and he booted the Greeks out of the place. And so he became the ruler. The Roman Empire was established. And the Roman Empire brought two things to this discussion that were absolutely critical and absolutely vital. Number one, we had the Greek language. Well, the Roman Empire brought roads. Everywhere, all the way across the Roman Empire, the entire known world at the time was connected by roads. Up until that time, if you wanted to go across the empire, you had to take a ship or you had to go over land and kind of forge your own way. But Julius Caesar and the Roman Empire introduced roads everywhere, which made basically the entire known world accessible by those apostles and disciples that after the resurrection carried the word, carried the message of Jesus in Greek, 
basically to the entire known world at the time. Wouldn't have been possible without those roads. The other thing that they brought to the table was a postal system. We didn't have a way to move letters from one part of the world to another part of the world until the Romans established a postal system. And so God knew that all of these things were going to come together at the right time so that after the resurrection, after what Jesus had done, after him rising from the dead, the apostles and disciples could proclaim that message around the world quickly and efficiently. You see, if the time was right, everything was just right so that everything could come together for the birth of Christ. But in the Jewish world, in the Jewish world, while all of that was going on, there was 400 years of silence. There was 400 years between when Malachi spoke the last prophecies and the time when the angel came and spoke to Mary and to Joseph. 400 years when they had not heard from God. 400 years when I'm sure they were saying, God, have you forgotten about us? Hello, we're here. What's going on in the world, God? What are we doing here? You know, this has been a very, very rough year. This has been a crazy year. In fact, I don't know if any of us planned on a year like this. I'm just curious, did anyone in, uh, in their five-year plan in 2015 buy stock in face mask companies? Anybody at all? It caught us all. We're all like, what is going on with all of this? You may feel like you're not hearing from God at all in the midst of all of these troubles. You may feel like you're in that quiet moment, in that, in that 400 years of silence, but for you it might have been 40 days or it might have been 40 months. Is God still speaking? And the answer is a resounding yes. Maybe not the way he came to Mary or to Joseph in a dream or in person, but God still speaks. He speaks through his word. Listen, if you're not hearing from him, if you're feeling like you're in a vacuum and you're just not hearing from him right now, I want to tell you, open his word. Get in the habit of reading the Bible every day. Because God still speaks to his people through his word. It's the living word. And you might say, well, how, how long should I spend reading the Bible every day? How much time should I spend in the Bible? I want to tell you to rush through the scripture. Rush through the scripture. Rush means to read until something happens. It might be a chapter. It might be a verse. It might be several chapters. Read until you hear the Lord speaking to you through his word. Because we don't live in that 400 years of silence. God is speaking, and he is speaking loud and clear in this time. Because all of these things have come together. All of the different pressures, all of the things in the fullness of this time, God may be trying to get our attention. God may be trying to break through some of the things that we have put in front of us. Will you take the time to open his word daily and hear from him? Well, this evening I want to talk about the three trees of Christmas. There are three trees of Christmas. There's the family tree, there's the tree that became the cross, and there's the Christmas tree. And I want to, I want to just sort of open up Scripture and think a little bit about what this means. First of all, let's look at the family tree. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, we just read from Matthew 2, which talks more about some of the some of the things we're more used to in the, Bible, in the, the Christmas story. But in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it starts out like this. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, why would it start there? Well, in that day and age, your genealogy, your daddy and your granddaddy and your great-granddaddy and your great-great-granddaddy, and trace it all the way back, your genealogy was like your resume. You were very impressive or not so impressive, depending on your genealogy. Now, the prophet had said that Jesus would be born in the line of David. And so in Matthew 1, they trace back the entire genealogy of Jesus back to the line of David. But what's really interesting about this is that when you look at that and it says, this was Mary, this was her dad, this was her dad, it doesn't say, long ago and far away. 
It doesn't say once upon a time. It says these are the facts that build up to the point of Christmas Day. These are the facts. This is not a fairy tale, although I will say this makes a beautiful fairy tale if you wanted it to be. I mean, think about what Disney could do with this story. They could dress it up and make it into all kinds of stuff. In fact, I believe they have. And it's easy for us to think that all that we celebrate is just a fairy tale. It's just sort of a myth. It didn't really happen. No, no. Because you see, these are real people. This is a real genealogy. This traces back in history. Jesus, the birth of Jesus was an historical fact. Jesus, the son of, Ma of Mary. I wonder when, G when Mary was carrying Jesus if she knew what the significance was. Because you see, it said the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And then you turn over to the book of Luke. And there's even more history. There's even more facts. I mean, we kind of read over this thing, and it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus. You know who Caesar Augustus was? He was several iterations after Julius Caesar. And by that time, Caesar had come to become the, the title. They were all Caesars. But Caesar Augustus stepped a little bit further. Because when you go back and you look and you see what that word Augustus means, it means one of the gods. He thought he was one of the gods. He thought that he was God. In fact, history shows us that he was, he was a rather slight man. He was like four foot seven. Do you know that? That's why we have Little Caesar's Pizza. <laughs> He's only known for two words in all of history. Pizza, pizza. That's all we know him about. No, actually, that's not true. He might have been. I don't, I don't know, but that's not true. But he was a real guy. He was a real person. His name was Caesar Augustus. We know when he reigned. We know what he did. Serenius, the governor of Syria, we know when he was there. We know when this census was called up. It is history. It is not a fairy tale. It is historical. The family tree, the first tree of Christmas, establishes the fact that there was an historical event in which Jesus was born. But look at this story as it goes on. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place, and everyone went to their town. And God used this little Caesar who thought that he was God himself to fulfill his plan because Joseph and Mary were from the town of Bethlehem. And so they took the perilous journey all the way from Nazareth, about 120 miles to Bethlehem. And that was hard to do. That was a rough, rough trip. And when they got there, guess what happened? There was no room in the what? You know why? Because everybody else who had lined back to, to David or anybody else that lived in Bethlehem, they were all there too. And so this little tiny town that maybe had two, 3,000 people probably swelled to ten to 15,000 people. And so it was busy and there was all kinds of stuff going on and everybody was just sort of into their own lane just trying to make everything happen. And then comes this very poor couple. And she is obviously pregnant. She's going to be giving birth that night. And you would think that somebody would have said, hey, can I give you a hand? But no, they were all too busy. They were all in their own lane. They were just going about it. And they tried to find a place, and there was no place for them to stay. Now, you know, we, we always like to bust the innkeeper and say, you know, guy, why, why couldn't you just open up somewhere? Didn't you notice that they were, they were in need? Come on now. In fact, you know, early history shows Mary and Jesus with little halos on their head, you know, in all of the, the pictures and stuff. You'd think if you opened your door and somebody's standing there with a halo, you'd think you'd do something about it, you know? It'd be like, hey, we need to make room for this one. I don't think that's what happened at all. I think what happened was they were so busy, they were so overwhelmed with the life of the day, they were so trying to just make sense and trying to get through every single day that they just didn't make room for Jesus. And we look at that and we say, how heartless. And yet I wonder how many of us don't make room for Jesus. I wonder how many of us get into our lane and we're just going and we're not meaning to ignore Jesus. We just don't even notice that he's there. 
And we get so busy and so full of ourselves and our schedule and everything else. And Jesus is left in the sidelines. You see, we like to indict the innkeeper. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we get too busy for Jesus. So my challenge to you is to set aside time for Jesus. This has been a rough, rough time. This has been a, a time of a lot of transition. I know there's a lot of stress in a lot of families. People have lost jobs. People are having financial stresses. People are having relational stresses because all of a sudden what, what used to be a house now becomes a classroom and a house and an office and everything at one time. We're spending tons of time together because of this virus. And there's stress points. And there's all kinds of things going on. And I want to encourage you today Invite Jesus into those stress points. Don't run right past him. Don't make no room for him in the end. Invite him into those stress points. In fact, the way that it's said in Matthew 6, he says it this way. Seek first. Put him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. Put him in the center of that stress point. Put him in the center of that relationship. Put him in the center of the finances. And then all these other things are going to be added to you as well. They needed to make room for him in the inn in Bethlehem. Do you need to make room for him in your life in 2021? You see, that's the first tree, the family tree. It sets the historicity. It sets the fact of what it is that, that we know about God becoming flesh. Jesus was born in a specific time, in a specific place. But why? But why? Jesus was born. He was born on a mission. And his mission was to fix what was broken. His mission was to go to the cross and die for us. And that's the second tree of Christmas. You see... Jesus, when he came, came as a baby, but he grew to be a man. There's a, a great movie. I, I don't necessarily recommend the whole thing, but there's one scene in it that is absolutely hysterical. Talladega Nights, The Legend of Ricky Bobby, right? Uh, Y'all seen that, right? I mean, you remember the, the Thanksgiving prayer where they're sitting around the table, and I think it's Will Ferrell um, is playing Ricky Bobby. And he sits down and he prays and he says, oh, little tiny eight-pound baby, we just love you so much. Thank you for all the things you do. And the granddaddy over there, he says, he was a man, you know. Well, that's true. Jesus was born a child, but he became a man. Had he not been born a child, had he not put on human flesh, he could never have gone to the cross for us. His blood would never have shed so that we could be forgiven. I look around the room and maybe at home today as well, you're dressed in red. I see so many folks dressed in red. You know why red is a Christmas color? You ever thought about it? In the early church, people wore red on Christmas to remind them that Jesus' blood was shed for them. The red blood was shed for us. Why was Jesus born? To forgive us of our sin to do what only he could do with the perfect sacrifice to forgive us our sin. And as it says in 1 John, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, Galatians 3.13 says it this way. Christ redeemed from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The second tree of Christmas is to forgive us, to purchase for us reconciliation with God the Father. There was no other way to purchase for us eternal life with him. 
Anybody here dreaming of a white Christmas? I mean, obviously, if you move to Florida, you're kind of over the white Christmas thing, right? But I want to tell you, you can have a white Christmas. You can have a white Christmas if you accept the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in Isaiah. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be scarlet, though your skins be red, I will make them white as snow. You see, that's a real white Christmas. It's to know that left to myself, I am covered in sin. I am red with sin. Completely unacceptable to God the Father. But as I come to him and for what he has done for us on the second tree of Christmas, I'm white as snow. I'm not dreaming of a white Christmas. Christ has purchased a white Christmas for all who believe. I think one of the hardest things about this year, I mean, and there's a lot of them that have been really, really hard, but for those, for those who have had loved ones in the hospital, those who have had loved ones in nursing homes, those who have been separated, those of you at home who feel separated from everyone else, it has been so very, very hard. And for those who have lost loved ones in this time, it has been incredibly hard because we just want to be together. We want to be able to be together. But let me tell you something. Because of the second tree of Christmas, we will be together. Those of us who know and love Jesus, those of us who have been cleansed by his blood, we will be with them together again. Even if we have lost them, he gives us the great hope of the resurrection. You see, Christmas, Christmas means that yes, the baby came and it was an historical fact, but that baby grew up and went to the cross for you and for me so that we will have eternal life. And we wouldn't want eternal life on this earth. We want eternal life in heaven with him and with our loved ones. You see, Tim Keller put it this way. He said, really, what we need is, a, is not merriment. We need the Messiah. We don't need goodwill. We need God himself. We don't need presence. We need his presence. God has given us the most amazing gift of all, the gift of purpose now and eternal life forever. And it's a gift that like that he offers to each one of us. It's the gift that says, there is nothing to fear. The first tree of Christmas is the, the genealogy, the family tree. The second tree is the, the tree on which he came and died. But there is a third tree, and that's the Christmas tree. If I were to give you this gift, if I were to, to, doesn't this look great? Isn't this a great, great looking gift? I mean, what could possibly be in here? Spoiler alert, there's nothing in here. This is empty. This is just a box. But it looks great, doesn't it? But it's well-packaged emptiness. That's all it is, is well-packaged emptiness. I wonder how many of our Christmases, I wonder how many of our lives are just well-packaged emptiness. I wonder how many of us are going through the motions of Christmas and trying to get so excited about this tree but ignoring the other two trees of Christmas. And when we approach the tree tomorrow morning or tonight or whenever you open those gifts, have you ever, ever, been, ever been disappointed in a gift? Ever gotten a gift and it was like, oh, gee, thanks. I really thank you very much. I had a friend whose son had a BOGO Christmas. You know what a BOGO Christmas is? His mom bought his sister an iPad, and he got the, the free headphones that came with it. She bought her daughter a sweater, and he got the tote bag that came with it. It was a BOGO Christmas. The boy's still in therapy like seven years later. You know? We can get so disappointed by what's under the tree because it's really just well-packaged emptiness. I wonder today, are you living a well-packaged, empty life? 
Have you got all the trappings of success, all of the stuff, all of the things, but inside you're empty? Inside, if anybody were to just reach in there, they would know there's really nothing there because you know there's nothing there. If that's you tonight, if that's you today, if that's you at any time, I want to encourage you, I want to beg you, I want to tell you to look to the second tree of Christmas. Because in him, we move and breathe and have our being. And apart from him, we're just well-packaged emptiness. The three trees of Christmas, the reality, the family tree, the cross, and the Christmas tree, covered in light. You know, this year has been difficult. And there's nothing that says that January 1st is going to make any difference for 2021. I just got to be honest. But we have a hope beyond hope. We have a life beyond life. We have a joy beyond joy. We have a Savior in whom to put our trust. A lot of us are in, in the middle of confusion right now. Some have lost jobs, some have lost fortunes, some have, have had marital troubles come up because of all of these other things. Some have lost focus, children have lost year of, of schooling. There's so many things that we look at and it's just, what's going to happen next? What's going to go on next? What, if we just could know, if we just had a light on the path to know that everything is going to be fine. If we could just illuminate that darkness around us so we don't stub our toe on a rock or something. If we just had light. And we look to the Christmas tree and we see the light. But that's just, that's just an imitation of the light of Jesus. Isaiah said, the people who had walked in darkness have seen a great light. In John 1, 1, it says, in him was the light of the world, and the darkness has not overcome it. Have you accepted that light? Have you allowed that light to come into your heart to illuminate and to give you peace on earth? Have you shared that light with others because there's goodwill toward men? You see, Jesus is the light of the world. But is he your light? Have you accepted his cleansing blood? Have you accepted his light have you accepted Christmas? Even as we think about the light, we have these little lights to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. And as we gather as a church and even as you're at home today, I want to encourage you to not think of the light as just sentimentality, to not think of the tree as just sentimentality, to not think of Christmas as just sentimentality, but remember that the light has come. The light has walked with us, God with us, and he went to a tree for you and for me so that we could be in heaven with him and that we could have this life more abundantly. As we sing Silent Night tonight and we turn on our lights, let's not make it just a memory maker. Let's make this an eternity maker. Let's sing from the bottom of our heart like we've never sung this song before because we have a song to sing. All is calm, all is bright. Let's stand together and sing Silent Night.
now receive the benediction. May this God of hope, the God who was born on this night, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen and amen.